Um, and at, you know, at the moment we're sort of starting to see lockdown ease, so I think we are all feeling a bit better <laughs> uh, because we can see people even though it's outside and some things, you know, people are starting to talk about getting back to normal life. And, um, you know, I think lockdown has been a, one of those experiences that has caused all of us a little bit to take stock of our personal lives. And, um, and also to take stock spiritually. Um, there are churches, sadly I know of churches um, that are closing. They haven't survived this time. And uh, there are shops, aren't there? I mean, who would have thought Debenhams would go? But there you go, there's Debenhams, that's gone. Um, or it's going, isn't it? And, uh, and things have changed. Things have been changed by the lockdown. And we have been changed by the lockdown. And, um, and today I, I want to talk about our, our hearts because um, the Lord tells us um, that we need to guard our heart. And, um, you know, it's one of those things, you kind of work out how do, how do you do that? And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. But Proverbs 19.21 says this, um, that many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. And uh, we have to remember, don't we, that ultimately God is the one who is in control. And uh, we have choices and we make choices, but if you think about the big picture on the world stage, the Lord's purpose will prevail. And that's why Jesus taught us to pray, didn't he? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. So in other words, God's will is already being done in heaven, it's just not happening here on earth, all of it, is it? And, and that's what Jesus modelled by his life, didn't he? And um, when he first came, when Jesus came into the world, he came as a baby and he came in poverty. Uh, he came with his glory veiled. And, and yet, even though he was in a way hidden and he came incognito, there were people that found him and people that sought him out. Um, there were the wise men who saw the signs in the heavens and, and they travelled a long way to go and worship him. And then there were the people like the shepherds who were surprised by the presence of Jesus when a whole load of angels came and told them this baby's been born. And they didn't just take the angels' uh, word, they went to see for themselves. And then there were people like Simeon and Anna who were in the temple praying day and night and the Lord spoke to them and said, you know, you are going to see my Messiah. And so they came and they held the baby and, um, and prophesied over him. And they were people with expectant and open hearts. And, um, and I think we all need um, to have an expectant and open heart. You know, they believed, I personally will see the Messiah. And the Lord answered that prayer. And Jesus has promised that he's going to come back a second time. Uh, there will be a second coming of Jesus. And, and this time, when Jesus comes back, uh, it's not just going to be a few that see him, the whole world will see him. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 27, for as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And you know, you think that we as church should know that, but you know, I have to tell you, there will still be people in the church who will be taken by surprise by Jesus' coming. And uh, how do I know that? Well, because Jesus tells us that himself. So if you've got your Bibles, uh, do you want to turn with me, please? We're going to look at Luke 21. And I'm going to read um, from verses 25 to uh, 36, the end of the chapter, basically. So from so Luke 21, from verse 25. And actually, <clears throat> this is part of, pardon me, uh, a whole long um, section, and you might want to read the rest of the section when you get home, but I'm just picking up sort of halfway through it. And he's talking about um, when, when will he come again? His disciples are asking him, when will you come again? And he's telling them, this, these will be the signs. So from verse 25, this is what he says. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. 
On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. He told them this parable, look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. And that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. So, um... So those are quite scary words in some ways, aren't they? Um, because um, we read that the last, you know, we're in the last days now, and we read that there's going to be all these signs, and some of those signs are quite terrifying signs, aren't they? Um, but what we need to understand is that we live in these last days, and Jesus is coming back soon. How soon? None of us actually know. Uh, but he tells us we mustn't be worried. So I want to say to you, don't worry about this. Don't worry about it. But know that it's going to happen. Be aware of it. Okay. So Luke 21, 28, he says, when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads. That's actually a very confident pose, isn't it? So he's saying, don't be cowed, don't be frightened. Be uh, confident. Because why? Your redemption is drawing near. So as God's people, we have every reason to be excited by Jesus' return, not dismayed. Uh, like the people present at, at his first coming, we should have hopeful and expectant hearts because the Lord is coming to redeem his people, to claim us, those that are his own in the world. But there is also a warning, and that's the guard your hearts bit. So um, let's have a little look at why we need to guard our hearts and what he says about that. So he says, Wait, uh, be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down. Okay, with carousing, that's a funny word, isn't it? We don't really use that word very much, do we? Um, but, you know, partying, uh, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And the day will suddenly close on you like a trap, for it will come on those all those who live on the face of the earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. So I just feel there is a warning for us. What is the focus of our lives? Where is our heart set? Um, we know that um, some people, their heart is set on partying and going out and getting drunk and what they think is having a good time. And I, I guess there's not really anybody here that's, that's like that, but um, where is our heart set even so? Are our hearts set on Jesus? Because, you see, if we're not careful, what happens if our heart isn't set on Jesus, then Jesus gets pushed further and further and further out so he's on the periphery of our lives rather than in the centre. And we need him in the centre because when he's in the centre, he is the solid rock, the foundation on which we stand. He is who we are, if you like, in the world. And without him, things don't have their rightful place in our lives. And they come and crowd him out. And so if we let that happen to ourselves, then when he comes, we're going to get caught out by that. We're not going to be delighted by that. We're going to be ashamed because we know we haven't lived how he wanted us to live. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, for, for many of us, the thing we have to be aware of is, is uh, about the anxieties of life weighing our hearts down and preventing us getting close to Jesus. And, and you know, there are times when quite legitimately 
our hearts are weighed down. You know, when we're bereaved, our hearts are weighed down, aren't they? And, and that's normal and that's right. He's not really talking about that. He's talking about when we just allow problem after problem after problem to build up in our lives. And, uh, and so we just push Jesus further and further out. Oh, I can't deal with Jesus. Oh, you know, Jesus, oh, oh he doesn't care about me because this has happened to me and that has happened to me. And actually, what, what we need to do when we have problems is actually, rather than pushing Jesus away, is turn towards Jesus and run to Jesus and say, look, Jesus, I have this really big problem. I like Penny's prayer about God's timing, and we're like, I need it now, I need it now. <laughs> and, and Jesus, you know, but sometimes Jesus does make us wait. We have to wait. And that's when, actually, we can let the anxiety become too great inside us. But actually, if we'll keep looking at Jesus, he is there for us. Fix your eyes on Jesus. See him as the solution to your problems. Uh, John 8 verse 12, Jesus tells us, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So, you know, when we have problems and anxieties uh, and difficulties, we need to turn to the light not run away from the light. Does that make sense? Mm. You know, because it's easy to sort of shut out the light because we feel overwhelmed by our problems. But actually, we need to go towards the light. We need to run to the light. We might not understand what's going on in our lives. We might not like the timing of God in our lives. We might not agree with it. But actually, we must allow God to be God, you know? So I guess the way we do this is actually watching and praying, which is what he told us to do. That's what he meant by guarding, you know, watch and pray. And he says, be a watchful people, be a prayerful people. And that's probably the best way to guard our hearts. And, um, you know, sometimes the world, they just throw up their hands in dismay and they say, oh, it's terrible, isn't it? What's happening in the world? This pandemic is terrible. And it is terrible. I'm not saying it's not terrible. It is. It is terrible, but we do have the ability to pray. We can pray and say, Lord, you know, we're asking you to move in this situation. We're asking you, we're praying for this person who's sick right now. We can pray, can't we? And, uh, and you know, we can also discern and ask the Lord what's happening. How do you want me to pray? And, and I think that's probably our biggest question sometimes is how do we pray? For what's going on and um, and I think you know we pray and we say Lord would you spread the gospel would the gospel be spread throughout the world would people know that you love them uh, Lord we should pray you know for those who are persecuted and we should pray for those who are marginalized you know some countries I mean India has got um, coronavirus really badly and in some of the, the towns they are um, you know some people are not being fed because they're Christians we should be praying for those people to be fed. We should be praying that everybody is treated the same, shouldn't we? So we need to be praying for, for those kind of things. And we need to be praying, Lord, give me wisdom to know how to live in these kind of days. Um, Psalm 90 verse 12 says this, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And I, I just think, you know, every day matters. Every day counts. Every day we have an opportunity to pray and ask the Lord to help us. Like we did at the start, you know, about David's prayer in the morning, you know, this morning when I woke up, I can ask for God's grace over my life. And, you know, we need to not just know about prayer. We need to practice prayer. We need to actively pray. And we pray in every situation, Ephesians 6 verse 18, pray in the spirit on all occasions, not just the good ones, folks, but on all occasions, yeah, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, so there again, keep watch, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And then um, that one that, um, did you share this one, Philippians 4? No, you did a different one, didn't you? But Philippians 4 is similar. It's do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So we can pray into every situation. And I, and I would say, you know, certainly the antidote to life's anxieties. Because let's be honest, sometimes we worry about things that are never going to happen, don't we? 
we worry about something and it never actually happens and, and it's an anxiety rather than something that we genuinely need to worry about. Um, so the best antidote to that is to pray because um, praying helps us to lift our eyes, to see Jesus, to see the bigger picture and, uh, and just to get revelation of how big our little problem really is. You know, in the light of his coming, Jesus told his disciples to pray that they may be spared the distress of those days. But even more importantly, that they be able to stand before him on his coming. You know, and I talked in like, if we're not ready, then we would feel ashamed. We wouldn't even perhaps be able to look him in the eye. You know, we, we all need to be keeping short accounts with the Lord so that we can stand before him and know that we've done our best, we've lived our lives uh, to the best of our ability for him. And you know, if we neglect our walk with Jesus, if we disobey him, if we choose to ignore his instruction, then a day may well come when we will be surprised and ashamed by his appearing. But I want to encourage you with these words from Hebrews 10 verse 39. Uh, where the writer of Hebrews says, he says this, but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. <coughs> you see, we're not those who shrink back. We're the people of faith, and the people of faith are saved, aren't they? So be blessed and be encouraged to persevere, to hang on in there, because you know that salvation, our salvation, Jesus Christ is coming back into the world to claim his own. And he's coming back for you, he's coming back for me, and he's gonna come back soon. How soon? None of us know. But who knows, perhaps we may be the generation that actually doesn't die, but sees his return in the flesh, because there is going to be a generation for whom that will happen. Who knows which generation that may be. So let's give him our all. And remember to guard our heart, keep ourselves in walking close to Jesus and in his spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen.